It's the auspicious festival of Shivratri. And Sister Genti, could you explain to us what Maha Shivratri actually is? When we say Maha Shivratri, then the word Maha signifies greatness, great. And so out of all the festivals within the calendar, I would actually say that Shivratri, Maha Shivratri is the greatest because this is the commemoration of God's incarnation into the world when it's the time of darkness. They describe the Ratri, the time of darkness, when God descends to actually bring about the day. It's been said that the darkest hour is before the dawn. And if we look around the world now, we can see that it's that time of great darkness, very much needing the incarnation of God to be able to share light with the world and bring about the dawn, the new day. Sister Genti, you've explained the significance behind um, this festival, but there are many myths and legends associated with this festival. And so what are the messages that these myths are actually giving? Um, when it's the time of Kali Yuga, the darkest hour, it's at that time that um, they say that God Shiva incarnates on the earth to bring about the day. And in fact, when they celebrate this, they always have, um, the t they choose the time when it's the dark night, a night without the moon, when the moon has reached its point of zero, and it's that darkest period. And it's at that time that the devotees would spend the whole night awake in God's remembrance, chanting, and then the next morning, of course, would be the day, um, the festival of the birth of Shiva. And through the night, there would be tapasya, there would be penance, and they would also be having various offerings that they would be bringing. Um, in particular, they would be offering milk. Um, when they have the image of the shivaling, they always offer milk to that image. Um, they, they would offer um, various leaves. And in particular, they would offer leaves that come from the ak plant, and that's not particularly pleasant. And so it's a surprise that that should be the offering to God. But it commemorates the fact that when human souls come to God, then when they come, then they're not very fragrant. They're a little bit thorny. They're a little bit um, filled with sorrow and much pain, but also filled with the vices. And so when we offer ourselves to God, we are in that condition. And then it's God's love that's able to transform us. And so the devotees aren't usually aware of this, but this is the story that always is linked with Shivratri, the offering of the ak flowers and the offering of the milk, etc. One of the more spectacular myths is an event that is called the Cosmic Dance of Shiva. And so what does the myth say about the life, creation, the goals of life, and man's relationship with God? Um, in fact, what they have done on the path of devotion um, is to say that God is the creator, the sustainer, and the destroyer, which is beautiful. Um, and they have confused a little bit the whole subject of Shiva and Shankar together. And Shiva is the cosmic supreme being, um, the eternal being who is incorporeal the being of light, who's then remembered in the form of the oval image, the Shivalingam. But Shankar um, is the image of Tapasya, through whom evil is destroyed in the world. And they say that Shiva is the creator of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shankar. So Brahma, the one through whom knowledge is imparted, so that new creation brings about new life, the new day, it gives new birth to souls through the awakening of spirituality and through spiritual consciousness. Then through Vishnu, the sustainer, Vishnu is the image of male and female together. Four arms, it must be symbolic, it can't be a physical reality. But it's the image of Lakshmi and Narayan representing male and female together. And these four arms work together with one head, one direction. And so the unity of thought within the harmonious family life when it's based on purity is that which sustains the world.
and then Shankar, Shankar the image that's able to destroy all evil. Um, Shankar is a form that's shown of the masculine image with the snakes around his neck seated on the lion's skin. Um, these are some of the images associated with that. And sometimes when they show the image of Shankar, they actually have a shivaling in front of Shankar. And it's indicating that Shankar is in meditation, in contemplation of a being who is higher than himself. And so the incorporeal God, the father and mother of the whole of humanity, and then Shankar, through whom evil is destroyed in the world, they say that when the third eye of Shankar opened, everything was destroyed, but it actually represents the destruction of evil. And the conquest of evil is also symbolized by the snakes around his neck. Normally you would be afraid of snakes, and in this case, what's happened? He has conquered them. And seated on a lion skin, again, the lion, the king of the jungle, representing matter, the animal world. And so the power of tapasya, intense meditation, the power of conquest of evil, all represented in this form. And through that also the power over the elements, the power over nature, the world around us. And so although Shiva and Shankar have been put together, yet in fact Shiva is the supreme and Shankar has a very specific role to play. And think about how when we talk about Shivratri, we never say Shankaratri, we always say Shivratri. Obviously, there is a difference. Or when we're talking about the Shiv Shaktis, again, the ones who are able to take God's power and have that Shakti in their life. So the Shakti, again, um, it's always associated with Shiva, not with Shankar. And when we speak about the Shiva Lingam, the oval image, again, it's representing God, but it's Shiva Lingam, not Shankar Lingam. So there's enough differences for us to see that, in fact, although we put them together, they are actually two quite distinct entities, two di distinct personalities. And so I think that's been part of the myth and legend. Um, of course, Shiva and Shankar being confused together has er given rise to many other confusions about that. But if we were take it very simply, um, Shiva, the creator, through Brahma, the creation of a new world, through knowledge, through wisdom, through truth, through Vishnu, the sustenance of the new world, through the power of goodness, the power of purity, and through Shankar, the destruction of evil, the destruction of negativity in the world. You've spoken about Shiva and Shankar, but just focusing on the image of Shiva. And so the image of Shiva or God in the form of Nataraja is filled with many metaphysical illusions. And so could you comment on some of these? Um, it's interesting because we were talking about Shiva and Shankar together. And I mentioned how with the opening of the third eye, evil is destroyed in the world. Apart from just the abstract form of evil being destroyed in the world, um, within the tradition in India, we would accept that time is cyclical and not linear. And so when we think about cyclical time, we're thinking about how from Satyug to Treta to Dwapur to Kaliyug, which means from the Golden Age to the Silver Age to the Copper Age to the Iron Age, and from the Iron Age, we move into the Golden Age again. And so time is eternal and time moves in the cyclical pattern. However, there's a very interesting period between the end of the Iron Age and the beginning of the Golden Age. And that's described as the Diamond Age. And that's the period of confluence. And in fact, the period of time that um, the figure of Nataraja um, refers to applies to that period of the confluence. Because what happens during the confluence period is that when God incarnates on earth at the time of darkness, to actually destroy evil, to finish darkness and bring about the day. There are three things through which evil is destroyed, through which Kali Yug ends and then Satyug, the golden age, is able to begin. And those three things are natural calamities and civil war and 
war on a huge scale across the world. And you can see how all the things that are happening in the world today at the present time indicate that we are very much in that phase. And Nataraja symbolizes the upheaval of all the elements all together. Um, when Kaliyu comes to an end, yes, human energies have been reaching their point of aggression and degradation and the extreme limits of corruption. And so, yes, we have civil war and all other types of war also. But the influence of the impure soul, Tamopradhan soul, on impure matter, um, Tamopradhan matter, has been of such exploitation and aggression that the whole system of nature has been thrown out of balance. And so now at the point when Kali Yuga comes to its end, the Iron Age comes to its end, all the nature, all the elements of nature come into a state of total upheaval. And the dance of Nataraja symbolizes the state of upheaval. But you see, it's like when you put clothes in a washing machine, what happens is that everything swirls around. But within the spinning of the clothes, within the swirling of the clothes with the water and the detergent and everything else, what finally happens is that you actually get clean clothes, hopefully. And the same thing is happening as all the elements spin around and the whole of nature gets into a state of upheaval um, because the system of nature has been put into a state of disruption and chaos totally through human influence and intervention and aggression but also through God's love, God's peace, God's purity. Although things move into upheaval, things then begin to calm down. And what comes out of that entire state is a new world, a world that has been cleansed, a world that has been purified, so that then the golden age, Satyug, can begin once more. And so the whole dance, the cosmic dance of Shiva, symbolized by Nataraja, is expressing this idea that from the end of the Iron Age through into the Golden Age, um, that period of the Diamond Age of Confluence is one of great turbulence, great chaos and upheaval. And everything spins around. But beyond that, then, everything settled down in its state of perfect purity once again. Nature returns to a state of order. The human soul has been cleansed and purified. That returns to its state of order and purity. And a world that is new, a world that has been rejuvenated, a world that is pure is ready to begin again. The spiritual significance behind Shivratri is quite significant. And yet it's celebrated annually once a year. Could you give some guidance as to how an individual can take this festival in such a way that it can alter their, their life or the meaning of their life on a permanent basis? Um, in fact, I believe that Mahashivratri isn't a festival just for one day. And definitely its significance is far beyond one day, as you've said. I believe that we're now at this period of confluence the end of the old, the beginning of the new, the end of one cycle and the starting point of the new cycle. And so in our human life today, Shivratri actually has a very tremendous significance and a very great impact if we were to understand it. And definitely not just for a day, but for the whole period of our lifetime. Because Shivratri is reminding us that now, at this time of darkness, it is time to have the awakening. The devotees would spend the night awake and they would be fasting. And the word fast has a very interesting meaning in Hindi, upvas. It means to come closer, upvas, to reside closer. And of course, people think that if there's some sort of physical deprivation of food, that's going to make you remember God more. And maybe that's true, or maybe at that time you remember your sandwiches more. I'm not sure what it is. But what it's actually referring to is the food for the mind, upvas. To make sure that I keep a fast, I have a commitment 
to having only good thoughts, pure thoughts, and nothing else that I feed my mind with. And so this fasting, the inner fasting, is that which is actually going to bring me closer to God and allow me to experience that connection with Him. Because my connection with God totally depends on the quality of my mind, the quality of thinking. And it is said that if there is that awakening for Shivratri, then the Bhagat, the devotee, is richly blessed. And so it's reminding me that if in this period of darkness I allow the soul to awaken, to recognize God, to be able to have that inner fasting through which I experience the relationship with the Divine, then this relationship is that which brings me all treasures and all benefits. You see, one of the things that's happened is that we've taken it as a myth or a legend that God can incarnate on earth. Whereas I actually believe that there comes a time when things are beyond human capacity. It's only God's intervention that can actually make a difference. And I think that we've reached the end of our line at this point. If I look around the world today, then I see that there's a huge amount of suffering, more so than even, say, 50 years ago. Um, if you talk to people at the United Nations, they will tell you that although the United Nations is working for peace in the world, working for a better world, yet all the different departments, whether they're connected with the environment or children at risk or um, population or um, the whole situation of disarmament or women and health, any of these issues, people who head up these departments would agree that things today are worse than they were 50 years ago. And that's even though we have more technology, more expertise in terms of information, we have more resources, we have more people, more staff working on all these things, but the problems haven't gone away, they have multiplied. And this is because it's actually not an external problem. The world has enough resources on all levels. But the problem is the state of the human being, the condition of the human soul. And that's come into that state of sleepiness, which is Kali Yuga, Tamo Pradhan, the influence of ignorance over the soul, the dark night of the soul. And so recognizing that this is a time for God's intervention and experiencing that inner connection with God is such that if I do this, then definitely I'm able to have all gifts from the divine and prepare myself for the day, but also I'm able to be an instrument to share these gifts with others so that others can also take benefit from them. Shiva is the one who's remembered as the benefactor, the supreme. The word Shiva itself has three meanings, the benefactor, the seed, the point. And I believe that Shivratri, being the great festival that it is, actually has a significance for every moment of our life, not just one day, and definitely not just for one night. But the significance is that I should be able to connect with the Lord, connect with God, the benefactor, and experience from God, from the ocean of love, the ocean of peace, the ocean of purity, the ocean of happiness, all that God has within himself, herself, so that I'm able to receive all those treasures. And my hope is that if people begin to think a little bit about what Shivratri really means, they will recognize that truly this is a time when it's important to connect with God, to awaken from darkness, from ignorance, and be able to experience all the gifts that God wants us to have. There are many other significant festivals associated around God and God's work, but how does Maha Shivratri, this particular festival, fit into the scheme of things when you think about all the other festivals that we have in relation to God? Um, at the start of the year, um, you have Shivratri coming along in February or so, and then immediately after this, a couple of weeks later, you have the festival of Holi, and there's a very deep connection between the two. 
when God comes and incarnates and transforms the human soul from impure to pure, then this is commemorated as holy. The sprinkling of waters, the colored waters on the soul. It's been said that company is able to color, company is able to influence. And so this is actually what's happening. God's company, through our connection internally with the power of yoga, is that which transforms the soul and changes it to the point where we're able to truly be the ones reflecting God's image. It's been said that we were created in God's image. And as we experience the connection with God, God's company colors us and transforms us so that our life becomes a reflection of the things that are within God himself also. Um, holy, of course, also is the commemoration of the ending of the reign of terror of the king of evil, Hernikashpa, and the power of Prahlad, the young boy who was able to conquer all evil simply through his love for God. And so when God comes on earth, the understanding that God gives us, whether it's an adult, whether it's a child, even an innocent one, but the one who has that innocence and purity of love is Prahlad the one who recognizes that there is only one God and refuses to accept any other false image. And so the whole story of Hirnakashpa and Prahlad represents that. And without going into the detail, just to show the connection, that it was through God's coming that Hirnakashpa was destroyed because of Prahlad's love for God and then the symbol of holy, the ending of evil, the burning of evil, but then the transformation of the soul colored by God. And so you can see the connection of that festival with the next. Um, there's also, of course, then the festival that comes soon afterwards, um, the birth of Rama, Sri Rama. And just preceding the birth of Sri Rama, we have the nine nights of the festival of um, Navratri, the worship of the devis, the goddesses, the memorial of the Shiv Shaktis. And so I'm seeing how if we start with the seed, the seed being God, Shiva, then you can see how all the different activities are commemorated because there's a story of the ending of evil with Prahlad and Holi. Then you have the nine nights of the worship of the Devis. Shiv Shakti, both words go together usually. And so from Shiva, the benefactor, the shakti, the energy, the power that human beings, especially women, are able to attain, again, is commemorated that it's at the time of darkness, the ratri, the no-ratri, the time of darkness that evil is finished through the power of God's um, representatives, in a sense. Um, the sisters, the mothers were able to take God's power and with that power are able to conquer their own evil and finish evil in the world so that then the kingdom of Rama, the kingdom of God can come on earth. And then later on in the year, you have the festival of Rakshabandhan and connected with Rakshabandhan is the festival of Sri Krishna, the birth of Sri Krishna. Because when God comes on earth, one of the things that God has to do is to remind us of our own original state of purity. So the festival of Rakshabandhan, the bondage that brings protection, the bondages are commitment to God to follow the path of purity. And the protection that God offers us then is a protection from suffering, from evil, to be able to go beyond all negativity and all external influences that cause pain. And so my commitment to God for purity brings me God's protection and blessings. And if I experience this and observe this, I'm ready to be able to enter into Sri Krishna's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. So Janamashtami comes after that. Again, a bit later, you see how there's a festival of the Sarah and the festival of Diwali. The Sarah, the burning of evil, the conquest of Ravan through the power of yoga, and again, the Sarah, it's the 10th night. And so nine nights preceding that has been the worship of the goddesses, the Shiv Shaktis, the Navratri Puja. And after the burning of evil, the burning of the devil Ravan, then you have Diwali, the festival of lights. 
a time when light comes into the world and it's a time of celebration, when it's also said to have been Lakshmi and Narayan's kingdom, the start of Ram Raj on earth. So I'm seeing that many of these festivals come two by two by two, but they all remind us of this fact that there's a time of evil, but with God's help, we're able to overcome evil, we're able to conquer evil, and when evil has been conquered, then what follows on after that is then a period of heaven, a period of paradise, call it Ram Raj, call it Sri Krishna's kingdom, but the reminder that then it's a period of goodness on earth, a time of the kingdom of God on earth once more. I believe that we are at this very moment able to experience how God helps us conquer evil and prepares us for the next phase of the world. I don't think it's just optimistic to think that Satyuk, the age of truth, the golden age is just ahead. I think that if we were to look at all the different signals of what's going on, it truly is the end of Kali Yuga, the end of the Iron Age, and it's time to prepare for the golden age, the new world. Sister Jenti, you've given us a huge insight, not just into Maha Shivratri, but you've also talked about Rakshabandha and you've spoken about um, Janmastami and all the other festivals. But is there a specific message that you can give to the viewers today in relation to this festival, Shivratri, a message that can leave an imprint on their life? I'd say, let there be the relationship with Shiv Baba. I use the word Baba, Father, the beloved Father, rather than God. God feels very far away. But Shiva, the benefactor, and Baba, my parent. So I would say that the most important thing is to make that link with Shiv Baba through the awareness of my own spiritual identity of the soul. And if I connect with that being of light, the Supreme, Shiv Baba, then each day I will experience God's protection, God's friendship, God's love, God's support, God's guidance, God's blessings in my life. And this would be my hope that every human being is able to have the experience of this.